Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, and today I'll be covering a chapter by Mary Buckholtz called On Being Called Out of One's Name, Indexical Bleaching as a Technique of Deracialization, found in the edited volume called Linguistics. So today we're talking about the very common occurrence of teachers or faculty members messing up the pronunciation of a student's name, especially if that name is perceived as foreign or difficult to pronounce. Immediately, the author makes reference to a skit from the comedy sketch show Kay and Peel, which features a black teacher from the inner city totally butchering names of white students. I'm y'all substitute teacher, Mr. Garvey. I taught school for 20 years in the inner city. Let's take a roll here. Jay Quellen. No Jay Quellen here? Do you mean Jacqueline? Okay. So that's how it's gonna be. Y'all wanna play. Where is Balake at? My name's Blake. Are you out of your goddamn mind? D nice. Is there a D nice? Do you mean Denise? Son of a bitch! <laughs> okay, so. This got me wondering, why is this so funny? Because this actually happens in real life a lot, notably when white teachers butcher the name of students with Spanish language names. And it's not actually funny when it happens in real life. And sometimes students might not even correct these teachers because they've experienced this their entire lives. So some might just think that's the way it is. That's just how things are done in school. The perceived racial makeup of the characters makes visible things we might not otherwise see. We got a black teacher messing up the names of white students that supposedly have simple or American names. But what's really going on here? Let's find out. Okay, so in the United States, particularly with white English-speaking teachers, there's an overall acceptance of the idea that these teachers don't necessarily have to feel obligated to try a little bit harder when pronouncing their students' names. This is what makes this skit so powerful, because it inverts a power hierarchy. You have a black substitute teacher who mispronounces all the white students' names. Because teachers, for better or worse, are kind of like unelected presidents. They got a whole lot of power over what goes on. So this chapter covers the practice of renaming, misnaming, and denaming, which has the potential to position students as completely powerless or as deviant or as outside the norms of the classroom or even American education. And these kinds of misnamings have the power to take away from who you are as a person. To explain what's happening here, our author presents a theory she calls indexical bleaching, which in the context of this article is about the practice of anglicizing the names of Latinx students who have Spanish language names. And these particular students want their names to be pronounced in a Spanish language phonology. So maybe not changing the last name like Garcia to Garcia or Martinez to Martinez. But to really understand the process of indexical bleaching, we gotta know what an indexical is or an index. Because if we really understand what an indexical is, it makes the whole chapter really easy to understand. People and scholars who study how meaning is produced and how meaning travels throughout the world are people who are interested in the study of signs or the field of semiotics. Now, scholars who are interested in studying signs have named a few different kinds based on what we perceive them to do. But the one we're talking about today is a sign called an indexical or an index, which is a sign that points to something. So just remember, index finger, it points to something. It's a sign that points to a meaning or a set of meanings. So let's start with a super easy example first. Let's say we're driving along and then we see smoke out in the distance. When we see smoke, the smoke itself, we can think of it as a sign pointing to fire. We don't even have to see the fire to know that smoke means fire. Now we can also think of the indexical aspect of people's names or names potentially indexing 
meanings. Meanings that go beyond the person the name is referring to. For example, let's think of what kinds of meanings might become visible when we think about the name Mike. The name Mike points to a lot of things, aside from me. For example, Mike can point to gender, because typically Mike is a boy's name. It might also point to meanings associated with Americanness, because Mike is a popular American name. It might also point to informality, because Mike is usually a nickname for Michael. So these are all meanings that the name Mike can potentially index, depending on who is interpreting the name Mike. So all those meanings could potentially be present, or just maybe a couple, or maybe a few, or maybe some meanings aren't even known at all, depending on the person I might be interacting with. So in this sense, some meanings come all the way to the front, while other meanings are backgrounded. Now let's think of Mike in a different context. Let's say I enter a formal space. People might switch to the name Michael to index or point to formality, or they might switch to Michael to signal that they don't feel like they know me well enough to call me Mike. So you see my name carries a lot of meanings. Meanings much more complicated than just referencing me, Mike, the person. Names can index entire social worlds, entire systems of beliefs. But in this chapter, we're talking about Spanish language names, or what kind of meanings might come to the front when anglicizing a Spanish language name. And then also what kind of meanings might get pushed so far into the background, we can't even think of them anymore. Let's do one more example and we'll be ready to take on the full keyword indexical bleaching. Now, what if my friend changes my name to Miguel? So turning Michael into its Spanish language version. Miguel can suddenly index even more stuff, even more meanings. For example, Miguel might strongly point to my culture or ethnicity or me being Latinx or Mexican American. Now, what if somebody pronounces my name Miguel? It matters who is doing the pronouncing. The context matters. Because at home in South Texas, I had a couple friends that would call me Miguel. And they called me Miguel because they knew I had trouble speaking Spanish. So Miguel in English to my friends indexed ideas about Americanness and friendship and the fact that I primarily use English. So names can point to or index a lot of stuff. Or like our author says, names are indexical forms with social meanings that are intimately tied to the context of their use. Hence, a particular name might simultaneously index such sociocultural positionality as gender, generation, ethnicity, religion, region, class, kinship, and more. Now let's keep following the same example, but change the context again. Let's change it to an institutional context, like a classroom, where a teacher, the unelected president of the room, changes my name to Miguel, which I personally hear as wrong, because that teacher doesn't know me like that. That teacher stripped meanings that I am proud of, maybe my Mexicanness, or using our author's vocabulary, that teacher decided all on their own to bleach some of the meanings that my name points to. They bleached some of the meanings that my name indexes. Or we might call that indexical bleaching. Damn, that was smooth. That was smooth. Did you see, see that connection? Nobody cares. As the author notes, indexical bleaching may be used as a technique of deracialization or the stripping of contextually marked ethno-racial meaning from an indexical form, like a name. So again, think of the way I felt when that hypothetical teacher changed the pronunciation of my name to Miguel. I felt like all the cultural and ethnicity stuff that I'm proud of was taken away from me. Part of my identity was stripped away. Often indexical bleaching involves the literal reshaping of ethno-racially marked names, phonologically, orthographically, and even lexically, in ways that reduce their ethno-racial specificity. So again, my name was reshaped in a way that reduces the indexical meanings that I wanted there. That's my heritage as a Mexican person. Okay, so maybe I'm being a little bit oversensitive. I'll give you a real example having to do with my name. When I was in grad school in New York, I remember the first time someone pronounced my last name correctly after 
three years of being misnamed. People usually pronounce my last name Mena as Mina. Now I generally don't care too much. I mean like usually, but when my name was finally pronounced in Spanish at my university as Mena, it was the first time in a long time that I felt like a Mexican American from South Texas. I did not realize that the sound of my name had so much meaning or how the sound of my name indexed my identity, my family, my home, my culture. And for those three years, I had kind of just forgotten what my name sounded like. And then when that professor during roll call actually pronounced my name as Mike Mena, it was startling. It sounded like me as a person. So names are powerful things. And have no doubt, names can make you feel powerless. Have you ever been in a situation where a person calls you the wrong name? How does that make you feel? Probably awkward. How about if a superior at work calls you the wrong name repeatedly? Or that boss calls you the wrong name in front of other coworkers? You might actually feel pretty powerless in that situation. Names can actually make power visible, which is why our author describes certain kinds of misnamings as linguistic violence. And also cites another theorist named Judith Butler, who calls this injurious speech. Butler says, to be injured by speech is to suffer a loss of context. That is, not to know where you are. One can be put in one's place by such speech. But such place may be no place. So a boss getting your name wrong would definitely put you in your place, as in an inferior position at work. After all, you probably would make damn sure that you don't mess up your superior's name. So getting to a couple examples from the chapter. This chapter focuses on Latina youth in a California public school where they are often renamed, denamed, or misnamed. And there are three examples in the chapter. One example was a recording of a group of students talking to each other and they discussed having to change their own accents for the people that they were speaking to at school. For example, one student wants to pronounce their last name as Gutierrez, but then says that that they won't understand it, so she has to change it. So she feels like she has to change her own name to Gutierrez. The other students in this group had very similar experiences. They too had to shift the pronunciation of their own name to accommodate someone in their school. This is actually a problem that goes far beyond just Anglo teachers or white identified teachers. It's actually a very common occurrence for Latinx people in public schools in the United States. However, we should also note, as the author says, and although I have focused primarily on how misnaming is wielded by whites against other racialized groups, this act can be perpetuated by anyone who benefits from structural power on the basis of race, class, language, and or citizenship. Although we can also note that it just so happens that when white identified persons really mangle somebody's name, they tend to get away with it with almost total immunity. It appears to be just the way things are. But notice that did not happen in the KM Peel skit. The fact that every white student complained is part of what made this skit so absurd. Is there a D nice? Do you mean Denise? Say it right. Denise. Correctly. Denise. Right. Denise. Right. D nice. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. Where is a a Ron right now? Here. Oh, man. Why didn't you answer me the first time I said it, huh? Because it's pronounced Aaron. Son of a Imagine if this was a room full of Mexican-American kids with a white teacher. It's interesting that I can't even imagine a scenario where this would happen, where the Latinx students would complain. So we should be reminded that context matters and that names can be sites of power struggle, especially if the context includes people from vastly differing social positions in society. Like maybe one student will talk back to a teacher, but maybe a student that's a recent immigrant just trying to fit in and trying to respect their elders and 
trying to learn English, they probably won't say anything to this misnaming. And then that misnaming slowly becomes a pattern that happens throughout their whole lives, which then reproduces the idea that that's just the way things are done in the United States. After all, this is America and we speak English, etc, etc. But you know what? Just because things are historically done a certain way, that doesn't mean that marginalized and racialized people don't notice it's happening over and over and over again. We notice. Trust me. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe and do support this channel on Patreon. I swear to God, if you don't support this channel on Patreon, you can download my publications from maestromikemana.com. This is Mike with the Social Life of Language, and we're done.